Welcome back to Extra Shot. What a great discussion, another great discussion on day one of the DSP Leaders World Forum. I am joined right now by Francis Hasem. Francis is Principal Analyst at Appledore Research. Thank you for joining us. Hello. And Jeff Gowan, who's Marketing Director at Wind River. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. So I think what transpires from the session we just uh, attended is that delivering automation is not an easy process, is it? So tell us about what you think is the best approach to deliver automation, Francis. Well, I think one of the interesting things is actually to recognize that Telco has been doing automation actually for a very, very long time. So it's not actually automation per se that is the issue that we're trying to address. It's automation in increasing amounts of change, whether that's technology, business models, etc. So when we're talking about this automation, it's the ability to be agile in that automation, not simply to um, uh, automate. And I think one of the, the areas in which, and, and some of the panelists were really bringing this out, is, a, is an idea of automation as something which is fundamental, um, is a fundamental building block of your new um, agile, ag agile or organization. Um, I, I, I have probably far too many years, close to 25 years in the OSS um, ar arena. And in telco, it's traditionally been the case that tel um, OSS is the Cinderella. You, 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 there's one ugly sister of the network, there's another ugly sister that is the BSS, and it's OSS that always comes last, is, is figured out. So, and, and great automation happens in that one. But as technology changes more quickly and all the rest of it, that's where the issue. So I think the, 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 the challenge, but the opportunity is to focus on that, that point. It's about automating for change, automating for agility. Building on that, uh, the, the two things that I heard, uh, key is really understanding what it is you're automating for, so having that really clear vision of what you're trying to achieve, uh, not just automating processes for the sake of automating processes, but really kind of what's your vision for going forward. Uh, and then on the other side of things, uh, making sure that you're creating an environment that the smart people, you know, the developers, the engineers, actually have the, the tools and the, the direction to, to fix those problems. So, you know, give them the problem statement and let, let them go and, and, and solve those problems on their own. Beyond automation, any other highlights or takeaways from the conversation we've just I, heard? I, the, the, the highlight actually for me, um, and I forget the gentleman who actually raised it, was this idea that we need to, we need to be thinking about uh, automation as a top, top down, not just a bottom up process. I think, uh, come back to my original point, it's really easy to see I've, I've made my fault management process slightly more automated or things like that. But to have a view that as we introduce the 5G, 5.5G or um, the gentleman connective tree in terms of a, a new business model in terms of transport, that automation is absolutely fundamental to the business model that it wants. So it needs to, uh, it's, it's that idea that automation becomes a top down, not just a, just a bottom up bubbling up idea. And, and one of the panelists brought up a really interesting point about optimization, uh, the, the idea that if you optimize for one thing, you're likely to sub-optimize for something else. So uh, really making sure that you're keeping that customer focus in mind at the end of the day. Um, so you know it's not just about cost savings, or while that may be important, but keeping the customer in mind so that so as you optimize, you ensure that you're not sub-optimizing something that will adversely affect the customer. So keeping the end user, the customer in mind at all times is vital, isn't it? Now we're going to move across the room to Yanni, who's by the pinball machines and the coffee van. Yanni, how's it going over there? Thank you very much, Yanni. I love how our Argentinian guest is turning the pinball tournament into a coffee tournament, actually. Thank you so much. So prior to lunch on Extra Shot, we discussed the previous session of the day, which was about achieving maximum operational efficiency, how service providers can best operate at speed and scale. Andrea, I was wondering if you could offer your thoughts on automation, because I know you have plenty. Yes, well, I think it was uh, pretty obvious from the panel that um, everybody's kind of midstream through their automation journeys. 
and the session almost felt like a therapy session to me, just in terms of everybody comparing notes and how painful this journey actually was. Um, and so I, I think it was kind of really interesting to kind of follow through to what the outcomes of, of automation are supposed to be, to kind of keep their eye on the spotlight of where they're heading to uh, and, and the efficiencies they gain and how really that blends in with the earlier session of, of cultural transformational change um, and how people's jobs are going to change over time as a consequence of automation. Yeah, I think during the session people were really insisting on the need to have this very clear vision and leadership when it comes to automation. Jeff? I'm sorry, could you, no, couldn't no. hear the question. I mean, your thoughts on automation to wrap up the uh, conversation we had earlier? Oh yeah, of course. So, I mean, as we kind of talked about earlier, the, the need for strong leadership and a clear vision of where to go and then enabling the people who are going to solve that and, and actually achieve that vision, giving them the tools in order to do it. Uh, you know, that combination is really important. Okay, so the next session is about why data and APIs are key to implementing the vision of the digital services provider. Any thoughts on, on that at all? Or is it too early? I think it's <laughs> going to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, it amazes me now um, with the use of APIs and low-code, no-code kind of tools that you can actually build software today that would have taken a, you know, five or six years to create. Um, I saw a demo last week of someone who created a, a, an imitation of Siri just by tying in a dial-up service, so you call a telephone number and it answered with ChatGPT, and you gave it this question like, "Who was the first person on the moon?" You, you answer, it answers you, and that was done in about two hours of work. Right? So imagine creating that kind of thing just by using APIs. So the opportunity, uh, once those ecosystems are in place, and they're absolutely in place in the IT ecosystem, they're not in place in telco land right now. And once they are, what can be created as a consequence of having all these things joined together? There are lots of exciting developments currently, really reshaping the industry. We mentioned automation, APIs, data, analytics, AI, but they're fairly disruptive, aren't they? So what's the risk here in terms of, of job losses? We've got to talk about it and, and the impact it's going to have on the industry. Yeah, well, I think people's jobs are absolutely going to change. Um, and um, if I think about the average kind of person who manages computer networks for a living, a lot of that um, job right now is kind of break and fix. Something gets broken, has to get fixed, and, and people are constantly scrambling to try and just catch up. So there's not a lot of long-term thought necessarily going into what they should be doing for planning, how the, the, they can benefit the business long-term. It's just that kind of operational spin, right? So as we get more automation, as we get more AI into those tools and things get fixed dynamically and automatically, what it means is these, the skill levels move up, right? But they can now focus on the things that are going to strategically benefit the, the company or organization they're working for versus just trying to keep the lights on, right? Mm, that's right. Uh, Jeff, going back to the first session of the day, which was about upskilling, changing, transforming, of course, but also attracting and retaining new skills and new talent. Uh, what really sticks with you after the conversation you've heard this morning? You know, there are a few things that stuck with me. So, you know, the, the example of uh, innovation happening, occurring, you know, way back in the 1800s. I mean, innovation is something that's always happened. And there was another comment uh, really around underestimating our workforce. Um, so re really, the, the trust that uh, the people that we have, if we put them in the right positions and give them the tools to succeed, they'll rise to the occasion and the innovation will happen. And I think uh, in addition to that, I think it's really important to, to factor in the ecosystem and how the ecosystem can help. You know, there's a lot of talk of, of insourcing versus outsourcing and smart sourcing. And I think, you know, it's going to have to be some combination of all the above. Uh, and, you know, with Wind River, for example, with the ecosystem, we've been able to uh, develop some experience with service providers that we're working with. So we can then in turn help other service providers as they try to achieve their, their goals, specifically in, in open and virtual RAN, which is where we play. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of elements there, but sort of trusting the people that they can get it done. Andrew, IBM is a brand that's always been perceived uh, as one that is at the forefront of innovation, always. So what efforts are you currently undertaking to attract new talent to an industry that constantly needs it? Yeah, well, I think you know, IBM has had the fortune of, of being a company for over 100 years that has constantly had to reinvent itself, um, sometimes more urgently than others. Uh, and so for us, um, We've always been a, a beacon of light, if you like, for folks who want to come and do research. And IBM has an amazing research organization. For people who want to go build products, because that's how we make our money. 
Uh, and so uh, from our outreach to universities, close from the early development perspective, we have a whole program in place for that. Uh, and, um, and for people catching people midstream. I mean, I've been building a new business unit within IBM for the last two and a half years, attracting talent up and down from the people who are my age to youngsters um, you know, in, in the US, in Europe, in, in, in India. And it's really been about bringing the best talent in, about folks, something that people really want to do. And if you can have that vision about, this is where we want to take the company, this is where we want to take our products, then people will, will come to that because they recognize opportunity. I have to ask you why it's important for IBM and for Wind River to be here at the DSP Leaders World Forum. What do you get out of it? Well, I think this has been an amazing place to, to get, well, the industry leaders. It's not often you get a room of such illustrious folks in one place, right? Uh, and focused on things that are about industry issues, not about vendors talking about their products. So I'm here to learn. I'm, apart from right now, I'm not actually here to speak. Uh, and uh, that, that input guides our strategy and our direction. Um, and of course, we get the time to spend in, you know, over dinner, over drinks, talking to our favorite customers and, and making sure we're servicing their needs. So I, I, I think it says a multiple of needs for, for what we as IBM do. Wonderful. Jeff? You know, similar to, to what Andrew said, uh, you know, we're here to, to understand and listen and learn from other, uh, other folks. You know, Wind River, we provide a, a very specific piece of infrastructure that goes from the core to the edge, and we do it really well. So it's our opportunity to share something that we know quite a lot about, uh, but you know, in the grand scheme of thing, it's just one small element of the entire telephone network. So it's great to get the perspective from others and really kind of see where it fits in and, and how we can work together. And what are your key concerns currently when it comes to the industry? And what answers are you hoping to find here at the DSP Leaders World Summit? Well, I guess I'm looking for markers of progress because I think quite often we come to these summits kind of year after year and it's like, did, could we have had this conversation five years ago? And would it, would it be the same conversation we, we have today? Uh, I, I think what's interesting is that um, it, it's quite hard to mark progress just in terms of months or quarters. But when you look at how the industry has really changed so dynamically over just the last two, three years, not just with, say, 5G, but with, with movements in lots of different directions. I mean, who knew that we'd be applying AI in the way that we are today in, in these networks? And that wasn't even really on the radar five years ago in the same way. Yeah, and I have to say, uh, I'm actually quite looking forward to the next session. Uh, you know, um, the, the big question's always been, how do we monetize all the work that we've been doing? And, and so, you know, we really need to invite the developers to the party. So I think the, the, uh, the work that's being done with APIs and opening up the system, making new different da uh, data available, uh, and sharing it with the ecosystem, that to me is quite interesting, because what can we do with the data? What can we monetize? What's going to be different? So I, I see this as sort of the, uh, the, the developers being invited, and then now they have maybe a route to get here. And to wrap up this conversation, what's your key message here today? Well, I think continuing the automation journey to that end point, we have to get there. Um, as I said earlier in, a, in my comments, I, you know, there's a, if we do it wrong, we pour concrete and we create a very fixed, brittle environment. Um, and that means that we won't have the flexibility to adopt all these new APIs to, to, to make these changes. So a very thoughtful approach to how automation is done. That's certainly, from an IBM perspective, what we do for a living um, in my group. Uh, and that's the message I've absolutely been carrying to everybody who listen to me here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, again, kind of similar to that, it's this notion of we have to do things differently. It's no longer a set it and forget it kind of network. Uh, things are very flexible, things are very dynamic. Uh, so as we design the network and operate and management and, and look forward, uh, it has to be flexible. Well, thank you very much, Jeff and Andrew. Enjoy the rest of the forum. Next, we have a session, like I've mentioned, about data and APIs and how they are essential to implementing the vision of the digital services providers. So enjoy the next session and see you again very soon for Extra Shot.